the FIA Tropical Conservation Institute and the Institute of Environment. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our fifth webinar in the series, Wildlife in a Changed World. My name is Christina Gomez and I'm the Assistant Director of FIU's Tropical Conservation Institute. I will be moderating today's webinar and I'm excited to welcome our panelists, Dr. Van der Brown, Dr. Meredith Gore, Dr. Paul Rilo, and hopefully in a few minutes, Dr. Mark Davis. Thank you all for joining us today. So as always, we'll be taking a few questions at the end. So please use the Q&A chat at the bottom of your screen to post any questions you might have throughout the webinar. So our first invited speaker today is Dr. Vanda Felbert Brown. She is a senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings Institute. Vanda is an expert in international and internal conflicts and non-traditional security threats, including organized crimes, insurgency, terrorism, and illicit economies, such as drug and wildlife trafficking. Vanda received her doctorate in political science from MIT and her bachelor's in government from Harvard University. She is the author of The Extinction Market, Wildlife Trafficking and How to Counter It. In this book, she explores the causes, means, and consequences of poaching and wildlife trafficking and discusses ways of suppressing them. Welcome, Vanda. Thank you for joining us again today. It is also my pleasure to welcome Dr. Meredith Gore, a conservation social scientist and associate professor in the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife at Michigan State University. In her research, Meredith uses risk concepts to build new understanding of human environment relationships. The majority of her activities can be described as convergence research on conservation issues such as wildlife trafficking, illegal logging, fishing, and mining. She received her PhD in natural resource policy and management from Cornell University and her MA in environment and resource policy from George Washington University. Welcome, Meredith. I would also like to welcome Dr. Paul Rilo, our director at the Tropical Conservation Institute at FIU and also the director of our main partner organization, the Rare Species Conservatory Foundation. As the director of these two conservation organizations, Paul oversees a number of in situ and ex situ conservation recovery man and management programs for endangered species, including Eastern Mountain Bongo, Brazil's red browed parrot, and the endemic Amazons of the Eastern Caribbean. He has worked on the front lines of parrot anti trafficking efforts for over 30 years, which has endowed him with unique insight into the intricacies of wildlife trade. Paul holds a degree in environmental engineering from John Hopkins and a PhD in ecological genetics from the University of Maryland. Welcome, Paul. So as you all know, we're gonna be talking today about the wildlife industry, trade and trafficking in the Americas and the risk to public health, which to many might not seem like a pressing topic considering the origins of the COVID-19 pandemic and that the world's attention is currently placed on wildlife trafficking in China. But the West seems to have historically underestimated the health risk associated to national wildlife trade and trafficking, which is reflected in gaps in, in wildlife health screening practices. Along with China and the European Union, the US is the top global consumer of both illegal and legal wildlife and wildlife products. A 2017 publication by EcoHealth estimated that the number of annual wildlife shipments doubled from 2000 to 2012 reaching 400,000 shipments per year and growing. These shipments tra transport approximately 200 million live animal animals annually, plus millions of dead specimens and animal tissue or meat according to the US Government Accountability Office. These wildlife products enter the US from various regions, including several hotspots for emerging zoonotic disease such as China and Southeast Asia. And although it's estimated that 99% of US imports enter the country legally, only a fraction of these are screened for disease. This is because the US, as in most countries, there's no federal agency in charge of screening imported wildlife for disease. And with few exceptions, there are no laws requiring disease surveillance of imported wildlife. Thus, millions of animals enter the US per year without being monitored for diseases that could potentially spill over to humans and other animals. So this, seems, so this same scenario is replicated in many other countries. So in light of this, it seems imperative for the public to better understand what practices in the Americas and particularly the US as a top global consumer and the public health risks associated with this. So my first question for our panelists today is, what are the potential risks 
of wildlife borne disease to people in the US? And what should people know about the wildlife industry and its practices in relation to public health? And I'd like to start with Meredith and then we can go to Paul and Banda. Thank you so much, Christina. Um, it's really an honor to be able to join uh, my fellow panelists and all the participants today. So I guess I was thinking about the response to this answer as kind of two dualities. We have legal um, and illegal, you know, wildlife industries that touch the United States. And then we also have direct and indirect risks that we can be thinking about. And so when I think about these direct risks um, associated with legal wildlife industry, you know, we have a vibrant hunting and trapping industry here in the United States. And so you have hunters and trappers who are potentially interacting directly with different wildlife species. Um, and then you have wildlife species that can have disease that are interacting with livestock. So you either have, uh, you know, zoonotic diseases that can go from wildlife to humans or wildlife to livestock. And this kind of human wildlife livestock interface is really important. Um, for us to be thinking about with regards to these wildlife borne diseases. And then there's also a lot of indirect risks associated with the legal kind of wildlife industry. Um, you have economic impacts, you know, disease can, as we see with COVID and, and coronavirus um, and other diseases like chronic wasting disease or pseudo rabies, you know, you can have um, decreased hunting and license fee uh, revenue, which funds state wildlife agencies here in the United States. Um, and then there's impacts on recreation, individuals' ability to kind of express themselves through culture and tradition. So there's all these kind of direct and indirect risks associated with uh, this disease transmission. And then you have this illegal side, uh, you know, which is, which is definitely something that we uh, don't, I think, talk about enough with, with, with regards to the United States. And certainly illegal wildlife trade offers a new vector for disease transmission to humans, right? So we have wildlife that is coming into the United States um, or moving throughout the United States. And this can influence humans. It can influence our companion animals. It can influence our livestock. And let's not have plant blindness. We're also talking about plants. So, you know, plants are often moved in soil. So there can be pathogens and, you know, uh, insects in the, in the, in the, in the soil and all of this kind of, uh, you know, uh, mushes together in these kind of direct risks uh, to, to, to humans and wildlife from, from, from illegal wildlife trade. And then there's all these uncertain, there's all these indirect risks associated with illegal wildlife trade in the Americas. You know, you think about the geographic distribution of these risks as, uh, you know, products come into the United States. They cross borders, they come into ports, um, and we also have um, disparate groups of individuals that are, uh, you know, you just think about the, the, the heterogeneous distribution of these risks around the United States and how we're going to deal with that. It's also really important to remember that we don't only have wildlife coming into the United States, we have wildlife going out of the United States um, in an illegal context. And so, again, you know, there's these, this movement of wildlife that is not always monitored, it's not always surveilled, and so that then means that we have uncertainty associated with the disease risks. So I guess I just want to make sure that as we move forward, we're considering this, these dualities. So we have illegal and legal trade with, associated with our wildlife industry, and then we also have these direct and indirect risks. I'm going to jump in next. Uh, first, thanks everybody for, for tuning in and, and thank you for those insights, Meredith. You know, when, when we were first putting this, this uh, webinar together, I think one of the big challenges was trying to, to wrap our arms around the scale and scope of this question because the wildlife industry, and it is an industry in North America, is vast. The sheer scale, when you talk about the volume of animals moving into this country or, or animal products, particularly non-native animal products, and the industry itself that deals with, with native animals is, is just so huge that we have to break it down into, into manageable pieces. We, it's very difficult, for example, to figure out just how many zoological facilities there are in, in, in the U.S. Uh, if you go by USDA records, there's somewhere in the ballpark of between 2,300 and 2,800. That only really accounts for those registrants and licensees that, that actually adhere to the Animal Welfare Act, and there are many facilities that don't. There are facilities that work with exotic animals 
that are not required to be USDA licensed and are regulated at the state level. And then, of course, there are many facilities that somewhere fall, fall between the cracks. We're not quite sure if they're licensed at all, but they certainly have uh, plenty of animal dealings. And, and having managed the USDA, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and State of Florida um, facility for endangered wildlife for 30 years, I can tell you that the practices through which we basically understand these problems of disease risk transmission and, and, and other related problems come from a voluntary and self-policing mode. And that has evolved primarily because these industries are incentivized commercially and economically. Uh, species of high value get attention, those with low economic value get very little. And, and when we start trying to look at where the problems might occur, where these risks might arise, we have to consider that this is rooted in commerce. And, and that applies to the international picture as well. But, but, but particularly with cases in the United States, I think the public needs to realize that we do not have a catch-all international or national agency that is tasked specifically with this interface between uh, wildlife and public health. We have agencies that address bits and pieces of it, but it's not cohesive. And we often rely on very, very good uh, independent NGO and nonprofit groups like EcoHealth Alliance and others uh, to take care of this biosurveillance uh, and to bring those discoveries to light. It's also important to recognize that the, the real motivation behind a lot of the actions that people might feel uh, are warranted come from particular cases where we're playing a catch-up game. Something happens, monkeypox, uh, West Nile virus, uh, Nipah virus. And as a result, we respond to that. So our, our, res our response to the risk potential between the wildlife industry and the public is rooted in these cases where we see, in some cases, a, a very strong, almost panicked reaction to what could have been a very awful outcome. And, and we'll touch on some of those cases, I think, as we go forward in, in our discussion. But to kind of break this thing out in the open, I think the first thing we need to think about is the scale of the problem, the fact that we have difficulty defining just how vast this industry is, but we are well equipped for, uh, for actually collating an enormous amount of data. And that's to say that wildlife facilities and the wildlife industry itself offers a tremendous opportunity for biosurveillance because we have so many animals moving around between facilities or they are reservoirs for species, exotic species that may be the source of, uh, of zoonotics, that this is a potential, this is a great opportunity for us to tap into, to not only get a better understanding about uh, what's going on now, but also where our future and potential risks might be. So I'm gonna pass it off to Vanden now. Thanks very much. Thank you again for having me, and I very much hope that uh, Mark uh, is able to join even just by audio since his um, insights and their experience are. Um, phenomenally uh, important and useful. Now, I would like to step back a little bit to reflect on why we are um, having this seminar today on wildlife uh, trade and pandemics risks uh, and wildlife uh, trafficking in the Americas, in the United States, but broadly uh, in the region. Well, the obvious fact is what uh, Paul and Meredith already spoke about, namely that we often do not appreciate in the United States the enormous potential for a zoogenic disease to emerge here in the United States, in Mexico, in Canada. Uh, and so there is already uh, an enormous regulatory gap that um, needs to uh, be redressed, or at least that there needs to be effort to, to think about how to address this regulatory uh, gap. The second dimension of that, of course, is international action. The fact that the zoogenic disease like COVID was going to emerge was highly predictable. And we have seen a series of um, epidemics or pandemics that preceded it. And they produced a highly sporadic, localized, time-bound uh, response, but did not produce a global response partially because the devastation was far more limited, whether it's the health devastation or the economic devastation. COVID-19 changed that. Uh, 
although the number of deaths around the world is nowhere close to uh, sorry i'm now losing my audio myself uh, my in my video hopefully it will um, stay please let me know christina if my uh, video goes off i'll need to um, go off and uh, reconnect Okay. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, what, what COVID-19 really changed, I think, is the, the scale and the, the importance of having global rethink of how um, wildlife trade, wildlife trafficking, wildlife consumption is regulated. And although it would be faulty uh, and counterproductive to assume that there can be one size uh, fit approach and that policies such as ban all trade in wildlife are in any way viable, let alone beneficial, then nonetheless needs to be far more of a global exploration of where our responsibility lies and the responsibility of other countries lies. It's no longer possible to simply say that each local community will deal with the issue um, devoid of considerations for the global impact. Uh, this is not simply because of the economic devastation, the political uh, uh, devastation that uh, COVID has unleashed, strengthening authoritarian governments, weakening democracies with potentially lasting impact, uh, as well as the, the health uh, dimension, the number of people who died, but also the impact on conservation itself. One of the consequences of COVID is enormous economic downturn and the reduction of financial flows that are fundamental for conserving habitat and conserving species, and effects that uh, cannot necessarily easily be undone. So with this broad scope, why I think it's so important to talk about what we do at home in the United States and in the Americas, uh, both to have impact here and adequate prevention, but also to have, be a credible voice at the global level. Let me uh, now just make a few points about what Meredith and Paul started, about what the risks are. So we already spoke about the fact that there is a big legal trade uh, in wildlife that looks um, different than some of the wildlife markets in places like China or Indonesia. You don't have very many people going to a place with tremendous amount of different uh, taxa of animals to buy them, to consume them. The, the primary risk here is the importation of animals that are live that, uh, as pets or for zoos, sometimes potentially for breeding facilities. There is also illegal trade in the Americas. It's often tossed that the US is the second largest demand market. Um, the number is not quite uh, ground in uh, really much robust evidence. We frankly do not know how large these demand markets are. But not all illegal trade in wildlife poses the same risks of zoogenic diseases. You can make the argument that most illegal trade is bad for conservation, but it's not inevitably bad for zoogenic diseases. Again, we are really talking either about live animals or live meat. Uh, and it's in the US case, it's much less meat uh, than, uh, uh, than the issue of importing live animals. But we also contribute to zoogenic diseases or the risk of zoogenic diseases through our food production facilities. So we already had an almost pandemic uh, in 2009. At the time, there was the swine flu, H1N1, that emerged between the United States and Mexico and could, ha it was, uh, and, uh, could have ended up uh, being a global pandemic. The preparedness that existed at the time, uh, something called NAPI, a regional system between United States, Canada, and Mexico, uh, was effective in preventing the epidemic from becoming a global pandemic. But one of the big lessons at the time was that the expectation that the zoogenic pandemic will happen in Southeast Asia and only slowly arrive into the United States or Mexico or Canada was faulty that the disease can, the disease jump, the, the jump, the viral spillover can in fact happen here. But we haven't followed up on that. And in fact, the trilateral system, the NAPI um, authority that existed withered significantly since 2009. So with that, let me um, hand it over and hopefully Mark is online. Well, I'm gonna jump in and start a conversation between us a little bit while Mark is struggling with his computer, but he is going to be joining us. I think, uh, thank you, Vanda. I think, I think what you touched on is how illustrated 
uh, these particular cases are in um, not only showing how we reacted to these challenges, but then what results from them to be more prescriptive in our ways forward. And, and one that, that jumps to mind, there are two actually that jump to mind, and, and, and one is West Nile virus, which appeared uh, in the summer of 99, thanks to the veterinary crew at uh, the Wildlife Conservation Society, the Bronx Zoo in New York. And, and, and remembering that case well, you know, here we had an example of, of a novel uh, disease, not novel to, to this geography. And I think the people who first crashed into that thought, oh my goodness, um, we, we, we all better write our estate plans when we go home tonight because we don't know how this is going to sort out. Um, and of course, it turned out to be a, a really serious problem, not only for people, but for wildlife across North America. Similar case in 2003 was, was monkeypox, kind of illustrates just all the complexities that happens in, that happen in the exotic animal market where Gambian pouch rats being imported as pets into a Midwest pet shop were commingled with a number of other species, rodent species also sold as pets and prairie dogs. And the result was that um, some people got sick and we became we got really, really close to uh, a, a real disaster because a monkey pox, a wild endemic uh, to the continent of Africa, uh, and can cause some serious disease is not something that, that settles well in the West. And there have been periodic outbreaks or cases, I should say, uh, around the world. But what it illuminates is what happens when, in an exotic animal industry, we mix species that never see each other. And then we move them around between different groups of people. And, and it also illustrates our ability to deal with that kind of a problem because this is unfolding. We don't know what's happening. We don't know what it is. By the way, monkeypox is not treatable. You can't vaccinate it. It's, it's related to smallpox, so that's scary enough. But then when these things happen, we have to recreate the scenario that gave rise to it. And we have to try to figure out where were the, where were the weak links in that chain? What broke down? Um, we got lucky in the case of monkeypox. We got lucky in the, in the case of being able to detect West Nile when we did. There are other cases that are similar to that. We'll touch on those in, in a bit. But, but I want to throw it out to the other panelists. Do you think we are getting smarter? Or does COVID just remind us that we had this incredible uh, episodic and, and epidemic amnesia? And we're only going to deal with these things on a case by case basis. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll respond, you know, that's a big question. Um, and I'm a chronic optimist, so I feel like I have to say something, you know, I'll say this. Um, what I see is this, that there's increasing recognition of the fact that these are multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary problems. And I, I appreciate, you know, I think this panel embodies this idea that you need different perspectives, different sciences, different public-private partnerships to, to, to coordinate. Um, I think these are really complex issues, frankly, if um, I know a lot of really smart people that are working on these problems. If they were fixable in an easy sense, I think we would have done that by now. Um, but I see, you know, there are a number of, of challenges that I see also, um, and I think that I'll just, I'll just kind of throw a few out there. Um, we have sometimes a myopic focus on certain species and, you know, certain charismatic megafauna or certain human populations that are um, in privileged, popul privileged positions um, or have a voice or have an ear of, of decision makers. Um, and that guides our responses and any preventative um, kind of risk management that we might be dealing with. We also lack, you know, standards of comparison. You know, we, you said earlier, Paul, I think that, you know, we don't have a central unifying kind of authority to cope with these issues. And so that means that everybody's kind of working on these issues in their own little stovepipes, in their own little kingdoms. And we don't do the best job of coordinating sometimes. And so um, like segregated data, data that can't be integrated, um, powerful and vulnerable voices, and then this sometimes myopic or very, very focused, you know, laser-like attention on charismatic species uh, and, and high-value species, I think inhibit uh, the most kind of sustainable solutions that are out there. Well, um, 
Paul and Meredith, I would say that clearly we have not learned. I used that one example of NAPAPI, the international body between United States, Mexico and Canada, that dealt well uh, with uh, H1N1, even though um, there were problems and uh, some of which was thinking that the pandemic will come from South Asia, from Southeast Asia, that could have been rectified, but instead NAPAPI withered. Um, and indeed, uh, it is a human uh, characteristic to focus uh, most on threats that are immediate and uh, concentrated to a particular group. You, uh, humans are much uh, less well uh, focused and much less well uh, uh, capable of dealing with threats that are long term and diffuse. So to the extent that the threat is imminent, it's immediate, and it's addressable, the changes that it will, uh, the chances that it will be addressed are much greater than if there is an enormous threat that exists out but is not materialized on everyday uh, basis. What then that requires uh, moving toward better policy is um, institutional leadership. Unfortunately, what we have seen with the Trump administration until COVID was in fact dismantling a lot of the institutional framework that the Obama administration tried to put in, um, not just uh, with respect to H1N1, but also just um, uh, biosecurity issues uh, overall. Uh, part of the Trump administration's inclination to weaken institutions and deregulate. Now, in order for lessons learned to sink and to start changing policy, uh, we need to ask what are, um, what are the conditions to enable uh, those lessons learned to in fact be learned and to translate into policy? Well, Meredith already touched on one. Is the uh, issue solvable? Uh, the more policymakers and publics in general have the perception that this uh, problem is simply unsurmountable, that it's too difficult, too complex, then they will avoid dealing with it. So, uh, as you suggested, Paul, focusing on particular discrete dimension. What is the risk of uh, uh, viral spillover in zoos or breeding facilities uh, or even in pet shops? How can one put in monitoring safe practices to that dimension? What is the risk uh, of uh, viral spillover in uh, broad breeding facilities? Might perhaps require a different uh, uh, response. So chopping down the problem into discrete set of problems allows policymakers to more focus because they believe that there is something that can become uh, addressed. Uh, another issue is to what extent policy is captured by a uh, powerful vested interest. That's not a small problem. And that's not a problem that's unique to the United States. Indeed, uh, a lot of the uh, highly problematic practices in China uh, followed precisely industry capture. So after SARS, China was for a while willing to regulate, to shut down wildlife markets uh, and to enforce the ban that lasted about two or three years. Meanwhile, uh, the very powerful uh, wildlife trade industry, both legal and illegal, mounted significant counter pressure, delivered jobs, delivered um, economic um, uh, production, economic revenues, and was able to undermine the regulatory system because the immediate economic benefit would trump the diffuse, the diffuse amorphous spread of uh, spillover. So the, the sequence between SARS and COVID in China is a classic sequence of vested interest eviscerating uh, regulation. And obviously, if regulation is designed poorly to start with, then uh, there is a double or triple layer uh, of problems. The second issue is then to continue focusing uh, people on the threat. Uh, again, we see it from a variety of uh, other regulatory domains, such as, uh, H uh, such as uh, uh, HIV AIDS or cigarettes. When people believe that treatment is not available, when they believe that contracting um, an illness like H1N1 will uh, result in death, they tend to behave better. They tend to take precautions. When uh, treatment becomes available, the proclivity to behave irresponsibly because the consequences seem much uh, lesser uh, tends to rise. 
in the case of cigarettes, uh, uh, it's not so much uh, the lack of knowledge that uh, cigarettes can cause the, the diseases, uh, rather it's discounting the probability of that. Uh, so there is a need and an opportunity as a result of COVID to be shaping and harnessing uh, public attention to demand better policy. And uh, that, however, will not arise organically necessarily that requires Polish leadership, whether it's leadership in government or whether it's leadership in NGO. And I would posit that the same applies also at the global level. There is a massive debate in the conservation community now on how to regulate or not regulate or to change in the regulatory space um, in wildlife um, trade and wildlife trafficking. There is also a very substantial risk that if the debate goes on for a very long time and does not become resolved, policymakers will lose attention and publics will start discounting the threat, especially when vaccines uh, uh, become available. A vaccine for COVID specifically becomes available, but obviously that does not resolve the issue of other zoogenic diseases uh, emerging. Over to you guys. Well, thank you, Van, and thank you everyone for your comments. Uh, you, you did bring up the international aspect of it, and I'd like to build on that. Um, so what accounts for the wildlife industry problems today, and how do these problems relate to the international trade, both legal and illegal? Um, how are, and where are these disease exposure risks tied to wildlife industry practices in the Americas? I'll jump in on this one. Um, the first thing I think uh, to pick up on the thread of Anna's last comments is that we are trying to distinguish between those pathogens that could become pandemics and those that may still be a public health concern. And I don't think it's fair to simply dismiss those, um, those wildlife source diseases that um, don't become pandemics. In fact, the, the vast majority, let's just say 60 to 70 percent of all of the, the disease, the emerging diseases that we see are of wildlife origin in one way or another. The fact that they may not become pandemics does not mean they're not serious. And I think that the, the, the point here with regard to international trade and where we've kind of gone astray is that we have to improve and integrate the scientific literacy uh, that surrounds the epidemiology, the episodiology of wildlife diseases. And that speaks to the, the, the greater governing authority, whether uh, those decision makers, in fact, are listening to the scientists and whether we're communicating what needs to be communicated in an effective way. And of course, the answer to that, the overarching answer is no, we're not doing that very well, and we need to do it much better. One of, one of the aspects of, of, of solving that, that challenge is to recognize that we have been complacent, we have been reacting to problems. We tend to deal with cases as they emerge, and depending on, on how serious they are, we take them further. Uh, but those, those milestone events, which include West Nile and monkeypox and Nipah and SARS and MERS, when we look at those individual cases, what we really need to look at is what resulted in practice change. If you look carefully at those cases, there was a lot of attention given to them because the concern was great for each one. And yet, if you were to look at the congressional hearings that resulted um, in 2003, in part because of the monkeypox risk and, and other things, you would have thought that these hearings were held yesterday because there really was no legislative or policy-driven response that communicated the science of what was happening in those cases to an action step that was implemented. We used to have USDA inspectors for zoological facilities that were veterinarians. Uh, I think the field as a whole would recognize veterinarians as being the frontline people to recognize when there are problems, not only to animals, but also where there might be a risk to, of human exposure. And we don't see that anymore. So the capacity has diminished significantly at the federal level and also at the state level, where we don't have the level of competency in public health issues at the, le at the, le at the level of the inspector himself or herself. That's not to say that we should retrain everybody, but there is, there is an aspect of scientific literacy that has to be better integrated. And, and those policy changes and some practice changes become part of the culture of the industry, when, particularly when you start looking at, again, individual cases. 
we have brucellosis um, throughout the Americas. But uh, let's just look at uh, Brucella suis, which is carried from feral pigs. And we have a real feral hog, hog problem in the US. Brucella suis is you know, transmitted to hoofstock. It's a dead end host in most bovids. It can be a zoonotic, it can make you sick. There are at least six different species of Brucella that include goats and sheep and, and bovids, the biggest concern being Brucella abortus. Uh, which could devastate the cattle industry. But the point is that we see here just one little cluster of pathogens that impact public health. The public is largely unaware that there is a risk there. And, and in terms of regulation, in many cases, we're really way behind in terms of implementing the testing and the surveillance to show how much of a problem this could be, how much of an exposure risk this could be to farmers, to ranchers, to exotic animal managers to zookeepers as well as to hunters and people who consume uh, wild meat or wildlife products. So again, wrapping this thing back around, I'd like to, to, to see more of a focus on systemic changes that we've not implemented that would enable biosurveillance to be effective. And that starts with taking advantage of the reservoir populations of wildlife that we have in managed settings that's captive and also managed um, better integrating the information flow so that we increase that scientific literacy, but moreover, that whatever that communication needs to be at, at, the, at the level of the pathogen, it is at the level of the risk, that it's communicated effectively so our decision makers can use it. If this information isn't, isn't useful, then it's, it's not being presented in, in, a, in a cogent manner. And if we've got people that are deaf to it, that's a more fundamental problem, in which case, uh, obviously, we just need to get out and vote. So with that, I'll pass that one off to, to Meredith, and she can, she can. Thanks, Paul. Um, I guess, I, you know, I find your, your, your comments are really thought provoking with regard to kind of where and how um, these disease exposure risks kind of manifest. And so what comes to mind for me is the idea of kind when 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 I think about where I think about boundaries, you know, and you talked a little bit about science policy boundaries and science communication, but you know, I think about our geographic boundaries, you know, and what's happening at our borders. And um, you know, here here in Michigan, you know, we have you know turtles and tortoises that are smuggled over in cereal boxes, you know, by by individuals in in, in cars and. You know, we have we have geographic boundaries that that you know create these 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 risk interfaces. We also have sectoral boundaries. You know, we have private industry, we have you know parastatals, we have universities, we have non-governmental organizations, and there are all these boundaries that I think wind up creating problems through a lack of coordination, communication, um, and and kind of sustainable change. And then there's also all these issues of like jurisdictional and kind of author like author authoritative boundaries. Um, and I think that, you know, these wildlife disease risks are not just the purview of, I mean, veterinarians are indeed on the front line, I agree with you, but that shouldn't be the only kind of stakeholder group that's responsible for this. Um, and then I think there's like been this pivot towards the criminal justice and criminology community. Well, this is, you know, I, I think that's important. But they're not the only ones also that should be responsible for this. So I think that we need to kind of think about blurring our boundaries a little bit, intentionally kind of dissolving some of these barriers to, to, to working together on, on these issues, I think, in order, to over, in order to overcome some of these problems. I also want to speak to the how a little bit and the kind of convergence between legal and illegal supply chains. Um, we have amazing legal supply chains here in the United States and in the Americas. Um, and this enables really smooth flow of products, um, flow of money, flow of information. Um, you know, I see 106 participants on this meeting right now. You know, I mean, it's amazing. Um, but these, these conveniences are easily exploitable by, by, by some bad actors. And so we often see, you know, um, you know wildlife disease, risks are transited um, through illegal kind of supply chains that parallel and often overlap legal supply chains. So agricultural commodities, legally traded, traded wildlife. Um, and we don't have, you know, the appropriate biosystem, you know, biomonitoring or surveillance or even just reporting and data sharing uh, 
And I think all of these kind of issues associated with where and how um, pose problems uh, to solutions. Um, so I guess I guess those are some of the things that I'm that I'm thinking about. Um, Vanda, I don't know if you have anything to kind of build off of that. Sure. I mean, let me focus on the border and the specific geographic uh, borders. Uh, the reality is that only a tiny fraction of the commodities that flow across um, the U.S.-Mexico border and for that matter the U.S.-Canada border are inspected. Uh, and we're really talking here about the legal ports of entry through which the majority of contraband is brought in. So um, yes, the, uh, the contraband such as illegal drugs are also smuggled, uh, or for that matter, wildlife products are also smuggled through uh, the parts of border where there is not a uh, legal port of entry. But the vast majority of contraband takes place at legal ports of entry. The volumes of inspection uh, then that requires are enormous. And so even in something like the drug trade, which is a priority um, for the United States, the U.S. is really only capable of inspecting maybe 2% um, of all cargo that uh, goes across the border. That's not the number, that's shockingly low number, it's not the number unique. Uh, you see similar level of inspections in places like Rotterdam, in major ports. Sometimes it's even less than that. When we're talking about the uh, more uh, specific uh, types of shipments, such as uh, trailer trucks, it's perhaps 16% um, at the enormously effective, um, enormously lucky day, maybe 20% of the cargo that's inspected. That's not because people are stupid or indifferent, but because there are real physical limitations on how much can be inspected uh, before the entire legal supply gets shut down, which has vast economic uh, repercussions uh, for the United States and for partner countries with which the United States trades from food security to um, other economic dimensions. So how can that be overcome? Well, uh, in other fields like nuclear smuggling uh, or um, avoiding uh, drug smuggling, there is increasingly focus on inspecting, not at the border, but inspecting at, uh, 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 at source or inspecting further down in the chain or having multiple uh, inspections. Now, uh, some of it hinges on something called um, um, sealed cargoes or sealed containers, but essentially it assumes that uh, the people who are loading the cargo can be credible in doing diligent inspection. So they are neither corrupt, nor do they have, uh, uh, and they have the capacity to diligently inspect. So if we were to use some of the lessons from uh, the Non-Proliferation Security Initiative, the, the nuclear smuggling domain, or uh, the drug domain, um, such as bringing in um, avocados from Mexico, we would want to think of facilities at source. So in this case, the place from which the rhino is being uh, imported, for example, or from which the snakes, boss snakes are being um, imported, to be able to handle adequately the veterinary inspection and to be able to keep the container during transshipment uh, controlled enough that nothing else can be added to it. Oftentimes it requires or has required uh, for the U.S. to have the confidence that U.S. agents would be stationed abroad, such as in Michoacan, Mexico, at the control facility, that might not be equally adequate or equally available in uh, other parts of the world. But this is, some, uh, uh, this is an example of how to boost inspection of what's coming in, but also inspection of what's coming out. Uh, the United States uh, is no longer just uh, a consumer of wildlife product. We have become a source of um, uh, supply, uh, both legal supply, we export wild animals and, as well as livestock uh, around the world. And we also increasingly are the source of animals that are being, uh, that are poached and trafficked. Uh, you spoke of uh, turtles in Michigan, as a whole variety of other products that's emerging. And more of that is likely to come. Um, the same incidentally applies to uh, the Americas, to Central and Latin America that have robustly emerged uh, as uh, new sources of uh, trafficked uh, um, animals and that will continue emerging this way. So what kind of controls can we have on inspecting what goes out of the country? 
we oftentimes we inspect far less of what goes out than we inspect what comes in. So if I mentioned tiny percentages of what's checked at borders to come into the United States, you can take a tiny percentage of the tiny percentage and assume that's a safe assumption as what's inspected to be leaving out. Clearly, we need to play um, a much more um, uh, diligent and stringent role and lead by example, but also um, uh, to uh, prevent pandemics uh, or, or, or diseases. Paul is very right in urging us not to think just of pandemics and also not to think just of zoogenics, but also just to think of devastating uh, wildlife, uh, uh, native wildlife as a result of, uh, of um, exports. Uh, so that we do more uh, checking on what's leaving the country, not what's simply um, coming in. My final comment here would be that if we think we have a big problem in lack of awareness and lack of uh, capacity and monitoring in the United States, you can magnify that problem significantly in the Americas. Tremendous amount of wildlife moves legally or illegally between the Americas, between Colombia, Brazil, Argentina, uh, in the Central American space, between Mexico and Guatemala. Uh, whether it's trade in birds, uh, reptiles, uh, other animals. Essentially, there is very little monitoring of that, very little action to counter the illegal dimensions, and even far less monitoring of the uh, health uh, dangers that comes there. And so uh, what that again requires is taking, uh, uh, building regional structures and, and global structures and uh, pushing the information out, uh, informing publics, and incentivizing publics to demand action from policymakers. So I want to drill down a little bit on what happens when these, these cases emerge, because I think we're starting to frame this conversation very nicely in the thinking that goes into what should happen, where we realize and recognize our deficiencies. But um, I think what's often illustrative in, in, in real time is what, what, what we do when, when things go wrong and how we make a mess of things. And of course, uh, a lot of this is anthropogenic because we're moving these animals around. They're not, they're not getting from Africa to North America on their own. And, and these industries are, are driven, obviously, by a profit motive. But, but for example, we know that diseases hide out in wildlife and animal reservoirs. And, and where those are is important, but it's also how we move those reservoirs and put them in close proximity to one another and make these problems work. And so when we're trying to think, well, how do we anticipate that and, and do something preemptive? Remember, we can only test for the diseases we know about. So the diseases that we don't know about yet, the novel and emerging diseases, there's a whole other discussion should be a, a really fascinating webinar we'll get to at some point, um, is exciting because we can start to get a sense of where the problems might be and what sort of pathogens we ought to be looking for. The, in the case of COVID, it's not a surprise. We knew that coronaviruses and the linkage to bats and the whole history starting with SARS, CoV-1, um, should have been a, a wake-up call. And, and, and so these are the places where there is a lot of snooping. And again, some excellent, excellent researchers have done a great job to warn us about where these emerging diseases might be coming from. But, but for example, what often happens is we see something downstream and then we try to put it back together. So here's an interesting case that I stumbled across that was discussed a little bit on, online, and that was in 2017, there was a bird flu detected in shelter cats and in stray cats, feral cats in New York City. It's actually an avian bird flu uh, labeled H7N2. And apparently some, some kitties were getting sick and uh, the shelters became aware of this as something that was atypical, it was, not, it was not in the suite of pathogens that they were used to seeing. And of course, in the shelters, the, the drive to try to get some of these animals adopted. Um, many of the animals were sent out before the problem was fully recognized and appreciated. Thankfully, a test was developed rapidly. And, and this is the good part of the story. We have enormous capacity to attack a problem if we were really scared to death by it. And in this case, 
at least a thousand cats were tested and recalled and, 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 and pulled back into the system. And thankfully, uh, a real public health problem was averted. And, and that you have to attribute to here in the US, we have tremendous capacity at the municipal and the state and the federal level to deal with crises as they, as they unfold. But once again, this was not a known pathogen. This wasn't something that was on the radar. This was something that became a concern and, and the process to deal with it emerged because uh, thankfully we've got some very, very smart people and they were communicating with each other very quickly. Uh, when, we, when, we, when we think about how to redress these concerns um, in terms of regulation, legislation, and so forth, it really does come back down to information flow and being able to effectively communicate what is happening on the ground, those frontline uh, practitioners, veterinarians, animal managers, uh, livestock managers, inspectors, doing random sampling, uh, getting out there and, and building a database of what's normal so that when something aberrant occurs, uh, we have a chance of recognizing that. And then digging deep into it to figure out, okay, that's an aberration. What is it? How much of a concern should it be? And once it's established, once that, uh, that, that risk is, is, is assessed in a meaningful way, put that thing on the list so that we know we can look for it again. Don't just presume that it's going to go away and we don't ever have to worry about this thing again. Uh, if we do that, I, th I think we're going to be well on our way to being more prescriptive and less reactive. Meredith, what do you think? I think there's a lot of really, um, I, think, I think the future is bright for prevention. I think if we have the political will. Um, and I, I think that, I think that that, I don't know. Yeah. I think the future is bright for prevention. We know a lot of tools and technologies out there that I think can help advance prevention and, and thinking about how to decrease these risks in the future. Um, you know, I see some of the, the, the questions and answer, the, the, the questions from some of the panelists are talking about integrated approaches and focusing on ports and biosecurity. And I think that, I think that we have a lot of information that we can leverage. Um, I don't think we're doing enough, but I think we can do more. Um, I don't know, Vanda, is, is now a good time for questions, Christina and, and, and Paul and Vanda, or? Yeah, sure, so, so let's move on. We have a few questions from the audience and we're running a little bit late, but we'll take a couple. So what role can the Convention on Nature Protection and Wildlife Preservation in the Western Hemisphere comprising all the Americas play in addressing the problems that have been discussed, that we have been discussing? Well, perhaps I can, um start uh, answering that. The conventions uh, are useful initial points for mounting effective policy. They assume that there is some shared understanding, shared framework of understanding, if not shared uh, framework of policy. And that's useful to the extent that there is not shared understanding, that there is uh, um, uh, still a blame game of this is not my fault, uh, drugs are, uh, there is drug trafficking because you consume, no, there is drug trafficking because you produce. So to the extent that you're lacking that shared understanding, mounting effective policies is important. So uh, the convention is a useful platform. However, uh, a platform does not ipso facto uh, mean effective policy design and effective enforcement. And this is at this phase of policy design from a principle to actual operationalized policy uh, that issues like uh, vested interest uh, start to play a very big role. That issues such as resource and capacities uh, start to play a very big role and attention and will. So uh, you know, my take on the, on the convention is this is a useful uh, uh, tool, is an opportunity to embrace it and say, uh, we already have this tool, COVID just highlights how we need to move toward uh, protection. Uh, but uh, a lot of other steps need to follow from that recognition. Uh, so I don't think it's an adequate tool. I, I would echo that. I, I think um, what we've seen from conventions, particularly with regard to wildlife trafficking and trade, is that and it, they're very much like sign-on letters. We can get people that can endorse particular um, kumbaya and point of view that 
for the moment uh, seems to appease a, a, a certain faction. Uh, but in terms of practical implementation, sweeping change, they're often very disappointing. And they're also, also sufficiently vague in many cases that we don't really know what they mean. Um, I'm, I'm one of those people that uh, shuns bureaucracy whenever possible because I really think it comes down to who's getting their hands dirty in this stuff. And the responsibility for so much of um, what we do for nature protection and what we do for wildlife conservation um, falls to the individual, falls on our feet as individual people to moderate our behaviors, to be better consumers, to be intelligent and well-informed people so that we understand what's happening in the world, even if we're not part of that supply chain, even if we, we don't directly participate in it. We should be conversant, we should be literate in the issues. That makes us better um, citizens, global citizens. It also makes us instruments for communication exchange with people who may not have been exposed to these ideas. The whole part of these sort of webinar things, they're think tanks. They're, they're, they're meant to, to inspire future conversations and challenging ideas, not to make us feel comfortable, but in fact, to do the exact opposite, to, to, to be disquieting and to make us feel a little bit uneasy about our, our the convenience of being able to just talk about a problem and, and then imagine that it might go away. In the cases here, I think we're really coming down to to what extent does individual responsibility and does individual value systems, many of which are culturally entrenched, uh, drive these problems? Should we be eating wildlife? Uh, do we need to be eating wildlife? I know some of the respondents have been talking about bushmeat and the bushmeat trade. It's an insidious problem. It's a horrible problem. It's, uh, it's not about local consumption of wildlife. That's not what bush meat trade really is about. This is about the commercial uh, devastation of wildlife uh, for the well-heeled and, and the wealthy. And, and, it's, and it's, it's spawned uh, so many other crises. And that all boils down to how are we going to react to that individually? How are we going to elevate ourselves and our understanding of nature, respect for nature, not only so that we don't get exposed to another novel disease like uh, COVID-19, but so that we actually protect biodiversity and have a, a more intrinsic-based value system for nature. Paul, if I can, let me jump in on the bushmeat area, which is both central to uh, the pandemics and very much what uh, uh, the latest two weeks or three weeks of the conservation debates have been about. Um, I fully agree that commercial wildlife meat markets are extremely dangerous and should be minimized. We need to recognize that some populations around the world will be dependent on bushmeat for uh, meat consumption uh, that, uh, for, for, for protein. We certainly do not want to deprive those populations, often highly poor marginalized populations with limited voice in uh, policymaking both globally and locally uh, from that. And if we don't recognize um, their needs, uh, we can simply push them to illegal trade that will even further hide the disease and um, postpone the capacity to respond to the viral spillover. That said, however, while there might be populations, while there are populations of these um, special needs that need to be respected and protected, including by enabling much more um, um, inspection of that meat that's consumed in West Africa, that's consumed in the Congo, the meat that's consumed uh, uh, in other poor populations around the world, uh, by, by having testing, by having monitoring of that meat. We also, however, should not then slip into uh, the notion that just because some people depend on bushmeat, all bushmeat should be encouraged. And it is, as you mentioned, um, the issue of the affluent the middle class people that really uh, do not need to become used to eating anaconda. I mean, to stick in to the Americas example, there is a big takeoff of bushmeat consumption uh, in places like Peru just for the fun of it. Uh, permanent chefs in Peru are starting to present it. Uh, there is really no need to encourage that uh, kind of market development because sustainability is likely going to be a massive problem and the risk of health uh, dangers is going to be uh, massive. So the fact that we recognize that some need to have granted access to, say, bushmeat, 
does not mean that all bushmeat uh, should be considered as equally uh, uh, beneficial or, or neutral in how we um, respond to it. Now it gets tricky. I mean, we, you spoke uh, uh, the risk of disease coming from consumption of wild boars. At the same time, we have wild boar um, problem in the United States. We have also tremendous overpopulation of deer. If consumption of venison or wild boar will reduce those stocks, that can potentially have highly beneficial effects on restoration of habitat that's degraded as a result of overpopulation, or it could be buffalo populations in Africa. But again, it has to be done in a way that uh, does not result in significant uh, health risks. Thank you. So we have another question here. And what does trans so they say? What does transformative change look like on this issue? It seems that many solutions are targeting targeted at doing business as usual better, like better enforcement, which is not transformative at all. So they suggest, for example, a fundamental system wide reorganization across technological, economic, and social factors, including paradigms, goals, and values. So do you have any comments on that? What does transformative change look like? I'll, I'll yes. jump in. I'll jump in at, at first. Um, you know, this is this is what's great about these these sessions is that that is that is a really uh, gut wrenching question because I think some of us in wildlife conservation would love to see a completely different global thinking about wildlife, um, a consilience across disciplines and across cultures for what we would say is the future of of nature on our planet. And, and that's the spirit that I would answer that question with because the transformative change is us, it is, it is humanity. It is embracing some things that uh, we are not comfortable with. And it's the fact that we've overpopulated this planet. We need three and a half Earths to sustain the lifestyles that uh, people in the United States enjoy that we have, there's simply too many of us and we are doing great harm to this planet. Um, having said all that, in a real time practical sense, when we're dealing with a crisis in wildlife right now, not only uh, the decline of species and populations, the viability of nature, but also this human health concern, which notably brings attention to this issue because people are done. Um, in some respects, wildlife has never gotten so much attention, except when we think we're going to be killed by it. And, and all sarcasm aside, that's transformative change right there, because it is, it is prompting us to think beyond where we've been. These regulations and legislations that we might want to throw at this problem here and now to improve things a bit are marginal and they're incremental. We've seen that movie before, and we've been down that road many times. And it's probably what will happen. But on good days, I can imagine that people wake up and I can imagine that cold sweat of fear and not being sure about how the planet's going to return to normal might inspire us to think differently about how we live as human beings, how we treat one another, whether we consider um, reproducing or not, and certainly how we consider our relationships with with all living things, particularly with wildlife and wild areas. And in that spirit, I would say the transformation needs to start with, with education and unifying our species to better understand its relationship with nature. You know, let me jump on this well and sort of echo and amplify uh, Paul's point that transformation will occur or transformative effects will occur when both we as individuals and our institutions and uh, bureaucracies uh, and governments will realize that preservation of habitats and wildlife is essential for preservation of human health and well-being and not an obstacle to it. We still continue existing in essentially a framework, not just in the United States, whether this is India or Brazil, that um, environmental uh, concerns uh, are 
obstacles to economic productions, our uh, obstacles to uh, well-being. It's only when we come to realize that they're essential to well-being will we reach transformative mindsets and transformative effects. It also then, however, requires feasible policies. It's just not realistic that people will say, we will now live without air conditioning, uh, simply because we understand that uh, consumption of fossil fuels or, or other kind of fuel um, uh, is bad. People need concrete solutions that will, not that will not require significant downgrading of lifestyle of individuals and lifestyle of society. As long as we um, in the policy imagination community are stuck on solution that requires significant sacrifices to individual life, we are um, going to be struggling uh, with how many people will not be willing to be compliant uh, in that. And I would not degrade uh, at all the issue of enforcement. I don't think uh, that is um, really, uh, I, I would say that any improvements in, in enforcement are fundamental to transformation. If there is a new transformational principle that requires costs uh, and that is very easy to uh, evade because there is no enforcement, people will not comply. It's only when you have a transformational idea, you have conditions that allow for compliance, so obstacles to um, compliance have been overcome, so people are able to act better. Uh, but you also have enforcement that, that punishes non-compliance is where you will get sustained desirable behavior. So I'll just add two kind of maybe kind of complementary perspectives here with this, I, with, toward this question about transformation. Um, I haven't really heard um, a lot of, uh, I haven't seen a lot of comments and I just want to acknowledge that a lot of the solutions for transformative change don't always happen from above, but they can also happen from the ground. And so there's a lot of kind of community-based efforts out there to engender more kind of sustainable change with regard to some of these um, paradigms out there. So I think that was, uh, that's just kind of one, one idea in response to that question about transformative change. The, the, the term transformative change also implies that there was uh, like a systemic failure. Um, and so I think that's really interesting. You know, um, I have heard that this, you know, COVID-19 is kind of this generation's 9-11. Well, after 9-11, there was a recognition that there was kind of a systemic failure. And so that's when the U.S. intelligence agencies were kind of lumped under the director of national intelligence. And there was kind of a new, a new model of thinking, you know, I mean, you have to wonder, is this, is this what's going to happen? Is, is, is transformative change in this context a new, a reorganization of, of agencies, a reorganization of partnerships? Is it a reallocation of funding for scientists and ways of monitoring and evaluating um, different metrics with regard to trade? Um, and, and in many ways, I think that we can learn from history, we can learn from everything that happened, you know, post 9-11 and kind of capitalize on the, on kind of the, the, the good things. But I think also there's a lot of lessons to learn about best practices, maybe about what not to do. Um, and so I think, I, I would just like to add that I think that, you know, transformative change doesn't always mean that something new has to happen. We may just go back to kind of our roots and, and think, fundamentally about what, what do we know about what's happening on the ground um, at a local level and, and maybe try to scale that up. I don't know, just food for thought. Well, thank you for your answers. And I, I think that's all the time that we have for today, but you can find our speakers contacts and recordings of this webinar and previous ones on our website, tci.fiu.edu. And I would like to once again, thank everyone for tuning in on behalf of our main partner, the Rare Species Conservatory Foundation and FIU's Tropical Conservation Institute at the Institute of Environment. And I'd also like to thank Vanda, Meredith and Paul for all the information you shared on wildlife trade and for your insights on the risk to public health in the Americas. Thank you everyone and stay safe. See you again soon. <laughs>